Entonces, ¿qué hacemos? You're gonna, you're gonna... Yeah, sure. Thank you. Start in a minute. Yes. Oh, you right. We're just waiting for our other panellist. And here she comes. Behind you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> All right, Myra? I think we're right. Okay. Just a bit of background regarding the guidelines, well, more so the exhibitions that we were going to hold at the conference. The first Mining Animals Conference, we had 18 exhibitions during the event and it was extremely well received. It was the intent of making sure that animals, animal artists, and animals in art became a major focus of the conference. We have tried to do that on each, each time. 
the second conference only had one exhibition at the actual exhibition uh, or conference centre if you were lucky enough to get to Utrecht. The third conference had uh, one small uh, exhibition within the centre itself that was from school aged uh, young adults and elephants. And this uh, conference we try to have a larger exhibition of several artists uh, incorporating the works of uh, uh, the sexual, the artists, in, um, the sexual politics of meat, which will be shown by way of um, video uh, by um, a vet later in the conference. The works of Janet Solomon, uh, Catherine Clover, and others. And that was going to be shown at the Museum of Contemporary Art. Unfortunately, that fell through due to the um, curator, without going into specifics. The second was um, that we would extend it, once we got two new cur curators on board, extend it to incorporate um, uh, several Mexican artists. Again, uh, we had two spaces available. The first fell through. And the second was uh, well planned, and then the earthquake occurred. Unfortunately, that exhibition of a gallery, which is a museum within uh, in the historic centre of uh, Mexico City, it was badly damaged, and unfortunately, that had to be uh, cancelled. Um, at about that stage, we uh, decided to ensure that the artists involved uh, within the conference were presented or uh, helped with a set of guidelines. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So myself, as well as Jessica Ulrich, uh, Carol Gigliotti and Vet Watt, uh, with a bit of help from Carol Adams and Anna Christina uh, and others, uh, put uh, forward a set of guidelines which were voted on um, within the committee, but then also by the board, which then adopted those guideline, guidelines for future conferences. That uh, set of guidelines has gained a large momentum, I think a large momentum, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Thank you, and I'll pass over to Yvette. Thanks, Rod. Uh, Rod has actually covered <laughs> a fair bit of what I was going to, to, to discuss. <laughs> Um, but, yeah, I guess our concern was that in developing the guidelines, we wanted them to be useful not just for the artists. It was actually primarily, in fact, for the curators. So at the time that we were trying to find curators based in Mexico City, we weren't always certain of how much um, background understanding they had of animal studies and of what were appropriate ways to incorporate um, a visual arts program or creative arts program within a conference such as Minding Animals. So the guidelines were very much a collaborative effort, primarily drawn up by the four of us, but also with some extremely useful input from other members of the Minding Animals board um, and you know, making use of people like Mark Beckhoff, who's a, um, an ethologist as well. Um, there is already in place, and certainly was before we drew up the Mining Animals uh, Guidelines, the American College Art Association Guidelines, and we did certainly look to those um, to help us in the development of the Mining Animals Guidelines. Our guidelines go further. The American College Art Association Guidelines um, uh, primarily focus on the use of um, live animals, um, within uh, art exhibitions, whereas we are also concerned with the consequences of the way an animal or animals might be represented within the visual arts. Um, just as a, um, uh, an, an anecdote, um, Shannon Johnston, who I saw a minute ago just here, I had a <laughs> really interesting conversation um, earlier today, only kind of maybe an hour and a half ago, with Shannon, who um, 
recounted to me how she got to be here at the conference by virtue of coming across the guidelines, which we used in, and which um, Carol's going to talk about a little bit later, um, in um, some correspondence around the Guggenheim exhibition, Theatre of the World, Chinese Art, 1989 to something current. Um, uh, which caused some con controversy, which I won't go into now. Um, and some Facebook, po we, we wrote a letter and sent the guidelines to the Guggenheim, and that was posted on Facebook, which Shannon came across, came across Minding Animals Conference through that process. And so in this very roundabout way from drawing up these guidelines, we now have another person here um, and there have been some really interesting points of engagement that have come about through the guidelines such as that beyond just the application of them to the exhibitions that in the end didn't happen. So despite the fact that sadly those exhibitions didn't go ahead, they gave us an opportunity to actually really start to consider very carefully um, drawing up a document that isn't intended to be prescriptive. The point of it is that it is a set of suggestions, a set of considerations to be taken into account, both by artists and by curators. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Jessica, mm -hmm. who's going to take you through um, a, a series of questions and provocations and a little bit more background. Yes, we decided to keep it open, and I really just um, have a list of questions I would like to discuss, we would like to discuss with you. So it's not that we all have the answers, but it's um, I just like selected a couple of artworks um, that relate to the questions I'm going, going to ask you, the whole floor, and um, s s well also questions that, um, that we well, um, asked ourselves when we were um, developing the guidelines. Um, just as a brief um, introduction, um, the, the art scene, the art world has, has long formed a self-sufficient um, system close to animals as agential beings in their own right. So animals appeared um, as, as um, muse, motive, uh, material, model, or medium. And they were uh, consumed as exhibition pieces, and still are, of course, consumed as exhibition pieces, manipulated as object of study, instrumenta instrumentalized as, as mouthpiece, um, rendered as material. And I picked the work by Douglas Gordon, Play Dead, Real Time, um, just as an example for all those uh, diff different categor categories. So um, Gordon, you probably know the work, but Gordon um, had a dream. He literally had a dream. He woke up in the morning and thought, hmm, I never saw an elephant lay lying down. So um, he thought, he asked a couple of, of friends, have you ever seen an elephant lying down? And everybody said no. So that's a very sensational thing, um, seeing an elephant lying down. Usually the, they don't lie down, even in zoos. So he decided to just realize um, this dream he had, seeing an elephant lying down, this sensational image he wanted to, um, to show. Um, he rented an elephant, I think her name was Millie, from a circus, bought, uh, brought her to the Gagosian uh, Gallery in New York, along with a handler, who made her obey the command, lay down. And um, he filmed it. That's basically the video installation. So the animal was a muse, kind of, because um, he was inspiring, or she, she was inspiring Douglas' um, art. She was a motive depicted uh, out of curiosity because of her interesting surface also. She was a model organism uh, to be studied to understand um, a specific biological uh, behavior to generate information about that, elephants lying down. She was a metaphor, a symbol for all kinds of things, for wisdom, for time, other things, majesty, whatever. And um, she was a medium in the sense that she was a, a vehicle for meaning and was supposed to transport an abstract aesthetic idea. And she was, of course, material um, because her body was manipulated like a living sculpture. And also, of course, um, there was animal material, like bones and skin, um, like gelatin, in the filming material. So that's the real elephant in the room also. Um, even though the video is from a purely aesthetic uh, perspective, um, capturing indeed, um, that's a lot wrong uh, with uh, Gordon's approach. So um, I picked this example, yeah. So the Gordon doesn't see a problem of um, like uh, renting an elephant that lives in exploitative circumstances in a zoo, as I said. 
um, and he doesn't care that Millie doesn't want to lay down because that's very exhausting for, for elephants. They usually don't like to, to get up again and he made her repeat this task over and over again. Um, so he he's, um, obviously just sees this elephant um, and potentially all animals as available for his artistic interventions. So I picked this example to start with because many people who watch the video um, seem to think they see a dying elephant even. And that's no wonder because animals are of course regularly killed for um, art. An extreme, yeah. So I collected some questions as I said. Um, one stream of performance art in the 1960s especially used the ritual killings of animals as argument um, to work through violent interhuman conflicts. And examples might be Mexican artist, I think she's Mexican. Anna Mendieta, is she? Yeah, she's Mexican. Cuban. Mm, Cuba, sorry, Cuban artist. Um, Anna Mendieta, referring to a dramatic rape experience by decapitating chicken, or Kim Jones, working through his experiences um, serving in Vietnam uh, through the burning of rats. And this, of course, implies that one harm is worse than the other. And the reference to, for example, Vietnam renders the death of three rats meaningless in a wider context of much greater wrongs. Um, but of course, um, a work of art that is commenting on human issues unrelated to the animal reduces the animal to a metaphor, a symbol, and the animal is robbed of his or her uh, own identity and his or her interest, uh, for example, the interest not to be killed, um, is completely overlooked. So um, the way animals are represented, and this is um, very important also for, for the guidelines, influences the way we see animals and eventually the way we treat animals. So if an animal's, animal is marginalized or trivialized in art, it can have the effect that animals are also marginalized and trivialized in real life. And you can maybe just read along the questions I posed. So um, if an artwork addresses cruelty to humans by using animals, isn't cruelty to humans so much worse than it should be um, okay to, to use animals in art? Um, that is just an open question. And um, you probably know this artwork by uh, Adel Abdel Semek, um, was called Don't Trust Me, a video loop of animals being bludgeoned to death uh, with a sledgehammer while tied to a wall. And Abdel Semek <coughs> said that the killed animals would have been kill killed anyway. Um, and that this was the common practice in rural Mexico and that he just exposed the audience to this kind of violence also as testimony to animal suffering. And yeah, I mean, of course we all know that uh, things like this happen, we don't need to see them. And also um, if you want to critique violence, does it make sense to just repeat it? I mean, we, you would uh, certainly not accept the unwilling exploitation of women. He actually commissioned. I know, he, yeah. Yeah, 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 I know he, uh, he he could, yeah. Yeah. He Just bought so that's the animals. Clear. Yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah. yeah. So he, he bought the animals and. Mm -hmm. and yeah, and let them yeah, yeah. be killed. But he also said this is just normal. That's how right. they do it in, yeah. in this uh, town or wherever, in Mexico. So, but um, I just wanted to see that, uh, to say that we would certainly not accept uh, the exploitation of women, for example, in an artwork to make a point about exploitation of women, to make a point about sexism, for example. So, um, another example, uh, Wim Delbois, a uh, Belgium artist um, who tattoos live pigs, and so he's using uh, their skin as canvas, and buyers can choose from live or taxidermite pigs. Some buyers choose to purchase the piglets and let them grow old on a farm. Others choose to purchase the pig's skin after their death. So some argue, have argued that this is no different uh, than harvesting pigs for food. Um, and Delvoir himself says that they are even better off as pigs, in, for example, in intensive farming con conditions. So, of course, artworks are symptoms of the culture in which they were produced, and farm animals are part of human life. We breed them, we breed pigs, we live with them, we eat them. So why shouldn't they be part of art? It's an open question. Um, Delvoir's attitude, of course, might only reflect human behavior that's possible towards farm animals, but it should be remembered that artists have the power and the competence to change this attitude with their artwork, and he doesn't do that. So a more general question would be, does the right for artistic expression trump the bodily integrity of another li living being? And another very um, notorious artwork, Marco Evaristi's Helena, um, he exhibited uh, 10 living goldfishes and 10 blenders in the year 2000, and his idea was to place people before the dilemma to choose between life and death. So 
Mm, of course, human dominion, or domination, or the killing of non-human animals is is uh, just trivial. It's shop worn. So. One could argue that that art, that art that reduces animals to their use value is anachronistic and conservative art because it's completely outdated. So today, circuses are uh, being closed down. SeaWorld stopped breeding orcas. Bullfighting or fox hunting, even horse racing, is getting unpopular. So not to work with animals in art could be seen as progressive, maybe. Well, you see the, the, uh, the question I was um, asking considering this artwork and also Peter Singer kind of defended this artwork. Um, next example is Kathy Heiss, Bracing Animals. Um, um, she presented an installation at Mars Mocha uh, 2005 where she housed three transgenic rats uh, used in medical experiments and um, she also treated them, the rats, with alternative healing methods uh, because they were suffering like herself from Crohn disease and the museum conducted uh, daily conversations around the treatment of the mm -hmm. animals, cleaned their habitat routinely, had a vet checking on them regularly. So what's the problem then? Even uh, Peter came to, to prove the work, given that the animals were enjoying much better treatment than they would encounter in, in a lab. Um, so Hai herself later expressed doubt as to whether the, um, she should have staged the work in an institutional setting at all, given the way that, that works of art can be commercialized or objectified, so they, they become commodities again. Um, oh well. And you all know Hearst's um, work. He has made mortality the great theme of his works. He shows dead animals' bodies in gallery settings to confront viewers with the enigma of death. Um, for example, uh, he commissioned the death of several sharks to make this piece, and uh, he bought thousands of, of um, butterflies to make more ornamental works. Um, and very many art historians or art critics like Arthur Dento here in, on the slide has, um, really praise the work. And uh, usually people who protest the work come not from the art world. I think it's very important that people like Carol or Yvette or even myself um, are protesting works like this also because if it's just done by animal activists or general public, it's easily, uh, it is demissed by curators and art critics uh, usually as they just don't know what they're thinking or what they're talking about because they are not experts of contemporary art. Another example is uh, Oleg Kulik, a Russian artist who works with dogs, uh, his own dog, Butch, um, and it's a performative work as well as a photo series. So one could ask, ask uh, is it okay to work with the animals we um, live with, our own pets? What's the problem here? Is there a problem? And um, he even... Um, simulates or me maybe it's not really clear really um, performs sexual intercourse with um, his dog and so it's, it's of course a very transgressive and offensive work but uh, maybe art has to be transgressive transgressive and offensive um, yeah but would we think that it's acceptable to you know to to show if, if you if you're uh, saying that it should be allowed to work with your own pet in a gallery space your own dog um, would you also think the same if an artist would um, take his or her own child to a gal gallery space and just stage um, you know, their t daily routines? You probably would think this is exploitative. Um, another, well, yeah, just very quickly, Wim Delvoir also shows human beings in, in galleries. Um, this tattooed um, gentleman, Tim, um, has also been uh, shown in, in shows by Del Delvoir. So is there a difference if we um, display animals or um, human beings in a gallery? And if so, what is the difference would be an open question also. Um, two works with, uh, of, by artists who work with insects, Ren Renri, a Chinese artist um, who has a queen bee tied to a string and uh, the string is pulled over his body. So the, the whole, um, all the bees are following the queen bee and he has like this really interesting performance or um, video. Um, and is there a problem? Also, Damien Hirst's ornamental uh, butterfly paintings. I think somebody counted how many butterflies uh, had to die for Damien Hirst, and it's like almost a million or so for all his works put together. And um, it's not clear. Some people argue that insects might not feel pain. So why, why should we even bo bother to protest um, insect cruelty in artworks would be a question. Mm. Also, um, you, you might have heard about Tinkerbell. Um, I think it's a Dutch artist who broke her, Ill, her terminally ill cat's neck and made a purse out of the fur of her own cat. And um, of course, 
this caused an outrage and people started protesting the work and uh, sending her hate mails. Um, and she, she, had publi pu she published a book um, with those hate mails um, as another artwork. So um, protests, as is my question, are not always effective, but some exhibitions have been closed because of violent threats or physical attacks against art institutions. And uh, so should violence or the threat of violence be allowed uh, against cruelty to animals in exhibition context? Just an, an open question. Um, also, you all heard about this um, work by Guillermo Vargas, Habakkuk. Um, he, uh, one element of the installation is a dog tied to a wall, and the work was outraged in the social media when it was reported that the dog um, had starved to death as part of Vargas' work. So internet petitions prote protesting the dog received over four million signatures. And looking back and considering the other works by Vargas, the dog maybe probably never died, but was only tied up for three hours. But Vargas was instantly famous. Um, so negative reactions by animal rights activists, online petitions, etc., became part of this work and other works as well. So um, that this contributes to the success of an artwork. So wouldn't it be maybe a better strategy to ignore such um, artworks and not show images like this at all? Um, and also, um, this is a work by a German or uh, Austrian artist, Deborah Sengel. She um, shot this chicken, kind of sacrificed for Kentucky Fried Chicken. There's a KFC uh, label on, on top. And um, there were religious Catholic um, organizations protesting this, um, this work in, in Germany and in Austria. And my question would be, should animal activists work together with protesters who, who don't care about the animal rights agenda, with a different agenda, like in this um, for, um, 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 case, a religious agenda? Um, and I think this might be my last, oh, no, not really, but almost my last example. You have to stop me, Rod, if it's no, just no, taking too no much no time. No. Um, plenty of time. I'm sorry, OK. So um, the question here is, um, threats uh, towards animals can have a formative nature without doing any harm to the animal. Is this kind of art acceptable, acceptable in regards of animal ethics? And what about threats that didn't have been made, uh, uh, that have been made up by a misinformed public? And there are two works, um, one by Berlin artists, Ruben Matern and Iman Reze, um, the guillotine. Um, and um, the those artists built a guillotine and set up an internet election where users could vote for or against the decapitation of the sheep Norbert, so the sheep had a name, and the public voted against the killing, and the artist declared afterwards that they would never have killed the sheep or any animal. It was just like about the, the power of the internet and um, all this. So um, the same can be said about another work by Guillermo Vargas, Axioma. Um, he presented um, a healthy dog, an uh, image of, of a healthy dog, and promised to begin a blog publishing one photo per day of the dog until the Costa Rican election. Um, and the photos were said to show the effects of the passing of time on the dog. Um, so Vargas was, was instantly accused of planning to document the starving of the dog because he was already famous for letting this one other dog staff in the gallery, maybe, maybe not. So there was protests all over the place, but um, Vargas explained later that he had found the dog in the street, it was a stray dog, and it was very skinny, and he documented its recuperation over time. So um, the f idea had been to upload the photos of the dog's um, bettering uh, in ri reverse order. So Vargas described the reaction of, to this work as typical of a world in which people form opinions without being informed. and. Yeah, okay, this is just two more I th examples, I think, that are more positive in my view, but um, we could discuss this also. If you've been to the um, presentation by Ute Hörner and Anna Holk, you saw this work from Force. That's um, the, uh, it's a video about the, the, the artist uh, um, Hörner and Antlerfinger uh, deconstructing a leather sofa from Ikea and reconstructed the living being from which it is made, like a calf. And um, you could still ask, is it ethical, ethically problematic to use animal material? In this case, I would say it's, it's fine, but we could discuss this further. Um, same here, we, we, um, in our guidelines, we said we, we shouldn't you know, uh, put dogs in gallery spaces or other animals. Um, 
but uh, what about um, art for animals? This is um, Kurt Jurak and uh, Alex Bailey, an artist um, duo who perform for pets, and they usually go into the home of the pets, cats and dogs, only cats and dogs, and they um, yeah, just perform for them, and the, the animals can decide if uh, they want to leave or if they want to watch, so they make sounds and dance and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So um, is art like this problematic um, or not? If, we, if artists work with animals that uh, we cohabit with, um, and yeah, I'll leave it with that. And hand over to Carol. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. That was terrific. Um, Jessica put that all together, so mm. <laughs> <laughs> we should give her the credit. Um, so uh, this is um, a recent uh, incident, and this is kind of the, the part where we talk about sort of the guidelines and how they might have come in handy, maybe, if the curator had even looked at them, which I don't think he did or would want to. But anyway, uh-oh. Oh, no, it's, 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 it's about yeah. It's just, oh. yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Gone. So I'll just keep talking. Yeah. Um, so Mark. how many... How many of you um, knew about the Guggenheim exhibition? Well, every, almost everybody, right? Okay, so I won't go into great detail. Basically, um, you know that it was a, a show about Chinese art from 1989 to the present? Yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, three of the pieces made quite a splash, especially two of them. And w the first one was by, what are their names? Um, Yeah, Sun Yan and Ping Yu, um, and it's called Dogs That Cannot Touch Each Other uh, from 2003. So you, you, again, you probably know this, but just in case for those who don't, um, this is a, was a video. Um, the, do the dogs actually were not there, but this was a video that had been documented from another show, as you can see. Um, and the dogs uh, were mostly pit bulls, fighting dogs, and actually, it, it, if you know pit bulls, they're not fighting dogs, that's what we've made them into. Um, uh, so the dogs were tied and they're on, they were on these treadmills so they could never really get to each other. Um, so uh, the other piece was Hong Wong Ping's Theater of the World. Um, and I'm gonna go into a little detail on that one because I was actually involved in the closing of that um, in Vancouver. And that piece um, was basically sort of a panopticon kind of uh, enclosure in which a number of um, uh, animals, but particularly sp uh, scorpions, you know, small animals, insects, scorpions, um, l a lizard, um, what else? Uh, spiders. spiders. Um, and there was really no place for them to hide. It was very cold in the gallery, um, and it, there was a single lamp, um, at least when I went, and that was after other people had complained and the SBCA had come in, and um, Hong Wong Ping had, had supposedly worked with the gallery and with the SBCA so that the animals in the environment or in the theater would, um, would be you know, it would be much better and much more cared for and because there was, but when I went, there was no water out. There was no place for anybody to hide. And the big lizard was like, I got the light right in the middle of the room, you know, in the middle of the theater. Um, the SBCA then said, um, you know, this is not good. And at that point, Hong Wong Ping um, said, I, I'm taking the whole thing out. I'm taking the animals out. I'm leaving the pieces of protest. Um, and you know, talked about how, what a racist thing this was to have, and censorship. So censorship, and it was a racist, eth eth ethnic sort of criticism. Um, because his piece was, as a number of other pieces in this show on China, were about China. Um, so, and I don't have it. I thought I might be able to get on, up on, uh, thank you, okay. so. There was an enormous protest um, by many, many people, and if you read through all of them, which I did almost, um, many articulate, obviously educated people, obviously thoughtful people, it, you know, whether or not 
in Vancouver when the show was closed or in, in New York when the show was closed. I'm sure there were some things that were pretty blatant, um, but whether or not the show, the, the, the curators at the New York show decided um, to take those pieces out. They said specifically they didn't want to, and it was all because of the violence, the threat of violence. So that's why the show was closed. Um, and this was the statement, out of concern for the safety of its staff, visitors, and participating artists, the Guggenheim Museum has decided against showing the artworks. And it lists those two dogs that cannot touch each other and um, um, theater of the world. Now, the theater of the world was actually closed in France at the Pompidou, and it was shown at the Walker with much complaint um, and lots of protest. Um, so Vancouver was not the first place that people had been upset about it. Um, uh, the Guggenheim regrets that explicit and repeated threats of violence have made our decision necessary as an arts institution, and I think this is important, committed to presenting a multiplicity of voices, we are dismayed that we must withhold works of art. Freedom of expression has always been and will remain a paramount value of the Guggenheim. So, thanks. And I won't read all of these, though when I'm sitting out there I can't read up here, but um, a number of people weighed in, not the least of which was uh, Pen America, which I was very disappointed pointed in, um, and Ai Weiwei, oh, I, um, when he, and Ai Weiwei says, when an art institution cannot exercise its right for freedom of speech, that is tragic for a modern society. Pr pressuring museums to pull down artwork shows a narrow understanding about not only animal rights, but also human rights. So, um, Oh, I'm sorry, and then there's this sort of radical difference in socioeconomic conditions between China as, and, and then this sort of goes into why this um, is a, really a Euro-American value. But, you know, you look at, like, Joe Robinson was supposed to come, right? Yeah. I mean, there are many, many people in China who are doing great work on animal rights and animal sanctuaries and all kinds of animal issues. So I don't think that this is really about um, racism or a kind of ethnic slur or any kind of misunderstanding of differences in cultures. I think you know, that animal rights, and, and not just animal rights, but the care of animals goes across the globe. Um, now, what else, so we sent, uh, Hours, but before that, Stephen Eisenman, who was really fast on the on the mark, um, did a great, great letter that was published in the New York Times. Am I right? Um, and he says, artworks that participate in or enable the abuse of living human subjects are complicit in that cruelty. The same is manifestly true of artworks that enable cruelty to animals. The exhibition of recorded acts of animal cruelty is cruelty in the second degree. The artist and museum profit from the display of an earlier act of cruelty, and the audience becomes partner to it. Artworks presented in res respected arenas, such as the Guggenheim, have great legitimizing force to enshrine animal cruelty, or actual cruelty, not a mere imaginative representation of it, is to accept and even promote it. And, and I think all of us really agreed with him. Um, I wrote him, I, I think well, you were talking to him, and, and I think you were too, and you know, and I didn't really know him, and I just wrote him before I even knew that these guys knew him and said, this was great, I'm so glad you're here. Um, all of us have written about this work before, and I think, um, you know, it's still happening. So I think the fact that there are other people out there, the more people out there who are thinking about this and being as articulate as Eisenman um, is, uh, I think is really important. Um, I should say that he wrote to us and, and said, you guys are crazy, <laughs> basically. You know, th those, those guidelines um, are too specific, and there just should be one guideline, and that is no animals, no, li no live animals, is that right? In, in galleries. Um, and I think that's the thing that we want to kind of 
put before you. Um, and, and that is, you know, our guidelines are very specific, and I think we all agreed, and I, I hope I can speak for all of us, that we felt that it, you know, it's kind of, and I've taken a lot of, I know other people have too, taken a lot of abuse from the art world about my stand on this. Um, and, and so I thought, well, what the heck, you know, nothing to lose here. I, I'm, I, I think we, we should speak out on this and go really far with these guidelines. Um, because in any social movement or in any kind of movement, you need to really do that. You need to go as far as you can because eventually people will catch up, but not so quickly. Um, but it makes them think. So Yvette said, indeed your suggestion that the decision was based on fear of violence against staff, visitors, and the artists must be seen as ironic given that violence perpetrated upon the animals and the fear that these animals would feel, have felt, was at the basis of much of the concern, this is about the dog piece particularly, um, by those opposed, well, actually, it would be about the theater of the world, too, um, those opposed to these works being exhibited. Artists do not have some special moral or ethical exemption, and an artwork that is overtly racist or sexist or that promotes violence against an oppressed group should quite rightly be deemed to be unacceptable. And I, I think what we want to do now, are we ready for, I, I think we should open it up because one of the things that we really wanted to do with this panel is to hear from other artists. Um, there are a number of you, obviously, you've come to this, you know, and I, I know a number of people here, you know, who are doing great work and these are really these guidelines were really not meant for you. So, but I I think it's interesting that you know that you're here and we can talk and we can talk about this openly, because you may feel that these guidelines, you know, need to be changed. So we're really open I think to any kind of um, uh, suggestion from your experience and your expertise and your knowledge. And we, re we really want to know what you think. So we'd really like to have a conversation. I hope we have time. Oh, we've and microphones. Got, um, we've got 40 minutes? 50 minutes? No, no. 40, 45, 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Yes, So Mark. some oh. comments and questions. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, uh, Peter, uh, up the... Yeah, sorry. 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 No, it's good. Mark Peter? Thank you for the panel. Um, I was presenting on across this topic, but for my own area, which is performance studies, so contemporary performance, theatrical performance. I had a, and originally had, because I've written on animal performers' uh, histories, an anti-animals in performance position, but I've had to revise it because I found, I started observing a kind of species blindness happening in my own field where the artists would make a play or a performance about contemporary animal issues, but of course without living animals. And um, it would be highly obvious that it was about animal issues, whales, sounds, bears on stage, un surrogates, humans in bear costume. You couldn't miss it, the title. And the reviewers would completely ignore the fact it was about animal issues. And I, when this first started to happen, I thought, what's going on here? Initially, I thought it was a one-off, but now I've found a pattern. So I've had to revise it because I think there's an issue about invisibility. And if we live with animals, we need to make them part of all our world. So what's important here is how we work with animals in performance. And I came to the conclusion that the emotional relationships we have with animals are what need to be in my own field, need to be staged. Mm -hmm. So we need to be able to make in the art it very clear that this is an emotional relationship, this is a, a, a bond, or a, um, and how that's done can vary quite a bit. And so that's where I've got to, which isn't quite in alignment with your position. But I can just say, the two worst examples I've seen recently, 
in the vision, I've been in the visual arts where two artists, one in Australia and one in Germany, um, in Munster, put the beehive into the ex exhibition and clearly at the cost of the living bees. So there were dead bees in the exhibit, which somehow got cleaned up also. So I would say that it needs to be more nuanced than just a total ban. Comments. Sorry, not a question, a statement here. <laughs> um, I, I, let me just answer that with the, one of the things that happened while we were talking to the board, which I thought was really interesting, was um, Mark Beckoff, who probably you all know or have heard of, um, you know, is a cognitive ethologist, and he was adamant that, um, you know, that animals it, it put into a, a situation like a performance situation or brought into a gallery would be stressed. And, you know, even if they were dogs, like who are used to going to all kinds of places with people. Um, and I, and I, you know, I think we took that really seriously because, and this is one of the things about, you know, that we don't know a lot about how animals feel about these things. And, but, I, but I understand what you're saying, um, and that's kind of, kind of what we, do you want to go ahead? Um, I guess uh, what I find interesting in your proposition and is, you know, what are the species boundaries around this? So, you know, I think animals that are used to being human companions that we have a close bond with, such as dogs in particular. I think I would go so far as to argue that dogs immediately spring to mind because they form social groups with us and they trust us in, in, in a way that the average cat, for example, doesn't. I can't imagine taking a cat into a gallery and it being as comfortable as a dog would likely be. But beyond that, I mean, if you're talking about performances, I mean, you mentioned bears, for example. Can you think of a way that a bear, an an actual bear could be incorporated into a performance that would not... <laughs> I think it was actually the case, if I remember correctly, that we first put this fourth um, guide, the first uh, fourth topic, yeah. there's no reason why any li live animal, and we put uh, any wild animal, yeah. um, should be included in a performance or gallery exhibition. And then Mark said, well, dogs um, also shouldn't be allowed. And as you said, and dog is, I mean, dog, dog is a Mark ethologist. Mark yeah. is a <laughs> <He> dog. <knows> dogs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's one of his, his main, canids really is, yeah. are his main yeah. work. So we took him seriously. So we said, OK. I do think uh, species matters. Um, I'm next after her. So. Uh, I just want to uh, have a comment because um, I've been seeing uh, activists or artists that um, wanted to promote anti-speciesism or animal rights or whatever. Um, and uh, they are taking from Native American cultures over and over. This is an ongoing problem all the time. So my comment is that, you know, you have these guidelines are, are great. Um, but uh, there is a problem that is not resolved when artists think that they can take away from cultures and not ask for permission even. And this is going over and over. I've seen it like in the past six months. You know, so I just want to say that it's very racist and it's not ethical to take from other cultures like that, just even if the, the message or the art is great and it's a, a great message. You should not do that any time. And I think that artists, when you talk about this, you should always talk about this problem because it's a big problem. And in the United States, all my friends are always complaining about this. You know, like white people coming and taking always from them and from their traditions, culture, symbols all the time. So I think there is no excuse for that. And you should always talk about that in, in any conference, in any interaction, because that's a big problem. Thank you. Thank you. Comments? Hmm? Well, I, you know, I, I'm a dual citizen, so in Canada, I know there was a, you know, there's, there are many understandings and rules about this, um, taking, taking things from First Nations cultures. And um, 
coming from America. I was then up in Canada for 12 years, and and yeah, I yeah I learned a lot. I mean, I became very very aware of it, and 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 I think it's it's another thing that should have a guidelines, right? Yeah, maybe we should include that. Just well, yeah. Somewhere. yeah. I mean, I, you know, coming back to the College Art Association guidelines, they also have a set of guidelines on the use of human subjects in the visual arts. But again, it only really cover, covers the, um, the use of actual subjects, not the incorporation of, of another culture. But I mean, there have been in, you know, there's the kind of latest version of the culture wars. This has become really a pertinent thing and there have been a couple of very um, high profile issues in, in the last year, Sam Durant's work springs to mind, um, that have been seen to um, inappropriately incorporate um, another culture's story and the other one is, um, oh god, what's her name? Um, uh, the painter, um, oh, Dana Schultz. Dana Schultz's work of uh, yeah. painting of Emmett Till. Uh, you know, both of those, you know, caused quite a, a, a great degree of concern. Um, and the, it wasn't just around the public. I mean, there were artists that were protesting as well. And the two artists responded very differently to those things. Sam Durant actually, you know, worked with the... the um, the indigenous peoples and a decision was made to remove that work and, and actually I think it was burned in the end. Um, so it is a hot topic and I think in a sense what we're trying to do with these guidelines is address a, a broad range of potential issues for, for consideration to try and deal with these sorts of things. It's hard to know how far to go with that to try and cover every possible circumstance. Um, but these are certainly focusing on the use of animals and animal subjects, but I, I agree completely with what you're saying. Mark. Mark. Yeah, uh, just wondering, um, Jessica, whether you're troubled at all by the fact that, um, you know, you lumped all these, I mean, it was like a, a sort of a quick fire sort of troll through some of, I guess, the, the most sensationalist sort of exemplars you could muster. Um, but you didn't, it, in, in a way, it might have been the way that like something like the Daily Mail or the Sun might have tracked the same subject. Um, in, in the, you didn't, all, all these, you didn't sort of consider intentionality of the artist no. at all in any of these things. It was just, so they're all just basically, effectively you could argue they're all sort of um, straw men, you know, in the sense that you set them up and you knock them down. Um, they're, they're, they're all sort of vilified in this process. And, and so I just wonder what you thought about that um, and, and what you think it does to, to art and artists to, in a sense, to categorize them so sort of, you know, in, in a, such a damning way. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing, just, just not, I'm not wanting to make it another question, it's part of the same question, just to, to ban things. I'm just wondering where you sit in relation to something like Santiago Sierra's work and, and his treatment of, of um, human uh, agents within his work as, as a kind of an attempt to um, uh, challenge um, the, the condition of capitalism and its effects upon um, yeah. um, impoverished people. You know. mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand your, your, um, well, that you're uncomfortable with my way of presenting those artists. I did not do justice to any of the works. I'm aware of the fact. And I usually don't, uh, don't talk about uh, artworks like that. If I go to an art historical conference or so, I would never ever do that because that is the normal reaction. It's just um, that we wanted to give some examples why guidelines are important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, individuality, inflection, sophistication. Yeah. You, by making those guidelines, I'm suggesting there may be a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're probably right. Um, it, it was basically also a time problem. I wrote about the Douglas Gordon piece, The Elephant um, Laying Down, a long, long article. Um, it was just published uh, in, in Hamburg for a catalog. And I, most of, the, of my article is just about how great this work is, actually. And then I have like a very short paragraph about um, the problems it also poses. 
and um, taking the elephant seriously as an individual and not about only the aesthetics and formal qualities and the motivation of the artist and so and um, this would maybe would have been a better approach to do that just show like one or two examples and do justice th to these examples and I didn't do that uh, here because I thought this is um, maybe um, just a um, framework where I could could present it like that because it's not an art historical um, audience here and I know that most people in the room are artists or art historians or art critics and they know that the works have usually been read completely different and people, um, art historians usually don't point at the, the problematic aspects. I mean, if you read um, standard art history books, they all con uh, have Damien Hirst's work in there. Nobody uh, says it's a problem that he commissioned to, to kill sharks. So with the guidelines and in this Mining Animals um, conference, I wanted to, to point out yeah. the problematic aspects. Um, and I used only very well known, iconic um, works because I didn't want to, you know, um, just, just works that are already um, iconic in the art world and that have been published widely and everybody knows the reading usually, the usual reading. And um, I just wanted to, yeah, give a, a different perspective on what is problematic in these, these artworks. And I must say sorry. that, sorry, oh, Jessica. Sorry. Yeah. They are guidelines. Uh, they're not a ban as such. But I'm sure that what would have been um, exhibited would have reflected the guidelines in the long term. We have been criticised um, at varying levels by artist historians like Stephen Eisenman, but also by artists like Sue Coe, who have seen the guidelines and do not accept the very what they believe to have been prescriptive nature of the guidelines, but they are about, they are guidelines, they're not a, a specific policy that we are imposing as such. Yeah, that is important to say. It's just artists should consider these questions when they are planning to work with animals. And I forgot, I'm sorry that I'm still uh, talking, but I forgot the second part of his question. He was asking about human beings exhibited, like, Usually, I mean, there, usually there is a difference because uh, animals cannot give their consent. But um, I showed this, this one artwork by uh, Wim Delvoix. That's also, I mean, that's a, a person who probably gets paid to, to be in the exhibition, so he does it for money. Um, but it's not that exploitative, probably. The work by Santiago Sierra is different because those people are usually very poor that he uses for um, his exhibition. So that's also problematic, I think. And it has been um, criticized by art historians and also by um, human rights. Uh, organization and um, also dead animal bodies are usually now taken out of exhibitions you know like the, the human remains debate um, so um, there I think there, there are similarities we are talking about non-human animals but I am also opposed against exhibiting human animals bodies parts or live animals if they cannot for whatever reason give their consent I think the next question did you have a I, um, I was wondering if um, the Guggenheim curators ever responded to the um, letter <laughs> that was sent. No. I, I figured no. the answer was no. No, we, um, so we tried to send it firstly via email to two email addresses. Um, and I think because of the uh, volume of correspondence <laughs> they were receiving on it, uh, both of those emails bounced back. Um, but Carol Adams did actually uh, also send it via hard copy um, through post, but no, there was no response. One of the things I forgot to mention was that during this time also, um, I got contacted by Judy Carmen, who's an artist and works with Mary uh, Close? Oh, Mary Brittany Klaus. Mm -hmm. I forgot the middle name, Mary Britton Klaus and who, who actually has, has an organization about this um, kind of subject, um, or this subject. Um, but it was interesting because um, Judy, once the, uh, my, the guidelines came out, um, talked to uh, an artist who was going to be doing an exhibition at the University of Kansas, I think, um, and, and 
No, I'm sorry, the Kansas, Kansas, Kansas Art, Institute. Art Institute. And um, once the artist saw the guidelines, she actually changed her mind because what she was trying to do, and this is interesting to me, she was trying to talk about animal cruelty. So she was gonna kill a chicken. Now, I, I, you know, a lot of us here probably would think that wasn't very sophisticated, but I can't tell you how many times students in my 30 years of teaching have really wanted to, to do something like that in a way that, you know, would really tell people how terrible it was. And, I, you know, again, I mean, I don't think we're talking about work like Mark and, and Brindis's, and I said this to them, that doesn't intervene, and at the same time, the work itself is so powerful that it, it says so much about the situation all over the, you know, in, environmentally and, and about uh, non-animals, I mean non-humans. So I think, you know, I, I just wanted to say that was really interesting for us. I'll stop. Uh, Rosie next and uh, Ben Jenner and Ben. There's the microphone, Rosie. I do, you know, when I, when I think about sort of uh, when we showed the Mercia Canto piece uh, at the Animal Gaze, which yeah. was actually in a university, um, and knowing how he made it, which uh, was, you know, it, it looked far more sort of uh, intimidating or whatever um, than how he actually constructed the piece. Um, but the power of that piece, using those particular animals, or even if you think of films like Sam Fuller's White Dog, there are sort of certain things how artists construct or make films or make art that actually incorporates animals, but it isn't about the abuse of the animal, it's about how they contextualize the piece. And I think there's a lot of closing down within universities and within freedom of speech as well that um, you know, we have to think about when we're actually saying these are the rules and this is how we adhere to them as well. Um, I agree, Rosie. I think one of the most important things in all of this is that there is actually a contextualisation of what's, what we're looking at. So, for example, there is no intention that these guidelines would be applied in a way where, for example, a, um, a historic work would be seen as being unable to be exhibited. But, for example, if... Um, if in a Minding Animals Associated exhibition, somebody wanted to exhibit a series of artworks that were hunting trophies, the context given to that would be important. It wouldn't be us saying those works can't be exhibited. But what the guidelines try to actually tease out is the context for that work. How is it appropriate within an exhibition associated with Minding Animals? But further, even in terms of the, the dialogue around some of the problematic works that have come up recently, it is a case of going, well, rather than just shutting down, it's not an intention to shut down a conversation, but it is a case of going, well, what are the limits here? Mm -hmm. What are the limits to what's appropriate in that respect? in terms of how an animal might be used or abused, more importantly. Um, and so I suppose, you know, for me, I think, in respect of the idea of a limiting of, an arti of artistic freedom, I think artists work with limitations constantly. Yes. Yes. We work with them that are financial, we work with limitations that are thematic because of our own self-imposed restrictions or that associated with something we might be curated into. We work with, um, you know, things that are kind of limitations in terms of what might be culturally inappropriate. And so I think the idea that there has to be sort of, you know, um, by essence, apply, applying any kind of limitation is therefore going to, you know, seriously curtail artistic freedom seems to me ridiculous. Just thinking about 
Mary Britton, Britton Plus. Yeah, I, I mean, the, there's, there's also sort of like, um, you know, we're, we're also, of course, it's not about cruelty to animals, Thank you. Um, but it is about a kind of critical thinking as well, or how should the, we as artists develop that. And also, um, I suppose we've got to be very careful about taste. You know what's good taste, what's bad taste. Yeah. But there are things, uh, or there are artists who are working maybe with animal or or the image of the animal that actually is very powerful. But it may actually be quite ha hard to look at. Not that the animal is mm. is sure. damaged or physically, emotionally, but actually is a, a, a really useful, important art piece. Oh, well, I mean, Sue Coe's work. Oh, oh, sorry. oh I'm sorry. I don't. No, I just wanted to say a couple of things. One is, um, Sue Coe's work is difficult for me to look at, and yet I would never say that about her work. And the other thing is, I just want to say is that the, the book that some of you just heard me talk about pretty much came from thinking around this idea, uh, dialogue with Steve Baker, who a lot of you know, who I respect greatly and consider to be a friend, um, but who I disagree with. Um, on this issue, and and you know that's that idea that creativity is uh, for us on loan or a gift is really what I wanted us to consider. I can't hear you. Oh, oh. I'm but, sorry. But, 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 but I think it's important that we hear actually sort of, you know, discuss and argue and, and mm. yeah. Absolutely. yeah, absolutely. The next question is from Jenna, um, and then we'll go here. I have a question too. <laughs> oh. Oh. All right, and then, then Jenna, Isn't please. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. okay. Um, just want to say, an artist and also art teacher, um, I was, uh, I would like to defend these guidelines because uh, when we did, a, when, we, when we curated our mm -hmm. exhibition project, I was very happy to find them because we were going to, through some very heavy discussions. <laughs> and uh, I also liked it that they are so elaborated. So many things are pointed out, not to, just to cut it down to don't use live animals, but also to think about the materials, all these things. I really appreciate that. And I think it's really uh, an educational thing that you're doing with that. And I would also like to say it's not only for curators and artists, but also for the audience the audience should be um, kind of brought together with these guidelines because they also have to know what <laughs> uh, what what's behind uh, this discussion. Many people just don't know, and the audience needs it too. And um, when you mentioned while presenting that we have this uh, thing in films saying no animals harmed, of course we don't know exactly whether this yeah. is really true <laughs> or not. But as I see as a media artist, for example, in the game industry, now some, uh, people start to discuss about what happens in um, 3D game engines, violence against animals. There's no animal, no real animal harmed, but it's violence against animals that uh, is uh, legit, legitimating violence for a very wide <laughs> audience. And I think it's important to discuss these things in all these media, like film, art, and also computer games, and uh, go on. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Any comments from the panelists? No? Well, uh, only that, I would only just say that, you know, it, it's always great to think that something that you've done can be applied beyond its initial, you know, um, in, in intention. And so, you know, if it helps, that's fantastic. And like I say, they're, they're points of consideration, so that's great to hear. I'm sitting here trying to chew the cut on this, and there's Could two things. Could you just talk Jenny? loudly? Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here chewing the cud of, of all of this. Um, <laughs> and I, I don't like anything prescriptive. I, I hate rules. But... I think what one has to consider is this is an organization called Minding Animals. And you, from how I understand it is your role is to change perspectives. And th this set of guidelines, I'm not sure guidelines, maybe, maybe 
the word guidelines can be changed, I don't know. But you've put them out there, and you've had some rebuttals, and may I suggest that you open it up more creatively to more dialogue in maybe a, a much more creative way mm -hmm. so that it starts a discussion as opposed to closing down a discussion. It's, it opens up a discussion and becomes a lot more inclusive and a lot more um, nuanced. Mm. Um, and so that anyone coming to these guidelines understands that there's a, a breadth of viewpoint as opposed to a um, something more didactic and um, dictatorial. Comments? Um, again, I, I, for me at least, the the book I'm just finished is that um, I wanted to come at this issue and and come at how we see animals as victims from a, and I just was sick of it. I just didn't want to talk about animals as victims any longer. And because I feel they're so powerful and I also feel that again there's some, you know why why do that? I don't think it 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 helps. So it I mean I do think it helps, but I I just for me after doing it for so long, I wanted to approach it a different way. So in many ways, I think, I think what I'd like to take from what you're saying, I don't, to be honest, I don't like it when people say more nuanced because um, it sounds as if it becomes so nuanced that, it, that you back away from drawing that line. And, and well, let me just finish, and, I'm, I, and then, but I, I understand what you're saying, and I think what we're trying to do, and I think your point is well taken, is that perhaps, you know, we could do this in a more creative way. I think that's what we're asking artists to do, or supporting and encouraging artists to use their creativity in more productive, compassionate ways, I guess. Does that, Marcus, not, he's like going like this. <laughs> Could you go back to the, the very start of the guidelines? Well, we're waiting for Vic to talk yeah, about yeah, one of these guidelines. Can I remind people to fill out the sheet that's going around if they're interested in uh, being part of an ongoing discussion, the name and yeah, email that, address? And that would be, I think, really yeah. helpful. This is, this is that, in this instance, it's probably a good case in point where this continuing discussion can actually build on those guidelines and uh, make them even better, or even by the mere fact of changing a name. I, I, look, it was, it was absolutely the point of this panel. You yeah. know, there's yeah. a, there was a group of people who drew these up. Um, I think the overarching objectives for me were really important in terms of giving a context to how the rest of the guidelines should be read. And I agree that the language that we use in the actual you know, various points that we make is fairly strident. But I think that's important because I think it's there, it needs to be, in my view, it needs to be made, those points need to be made stridently, but they need to be read within the context of those two key objectives. Um, but of course, I mean, the whole point of this panel was to actually get feedback to actually that they were a work in progress in a sense, um, and that anything useful that can come from this can then feed back into them. Even, even this discussion filmed and tagged onto this would, if I approached a set of guidelines and saw that you were thinking about it. And oh, that's and interesting. Mm. And See? opening it up. That's a beautiful so, idea. No, but this is what I mean by more creative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I come to a set of guidelines and I think, oh my God, it, you know, it's, it's prescriptive, it's, it's narrowing. Um, but to be more creative in your, and more inclusive mm. in, in um, the discussion. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a dialogue around these things 
Um, it's just a suggestion. Yeah. Uh, I'm missing people up the back. I don't know if you've put up your hand, so you're in the dark for us down here, so. Okay? All right. Yeah. Oh, I just want to say something briefly with, um, <coughs> and just echo Uta's um, words too that. I'm really grateful that you've, you've set out these guidelines. I think Thank it's a really too. good idea. Um, because working as an artist, w I've only just started working uh, with the idea of working with animals, and <coughs> I found it very hard to find to find any information that, to sort of think through these things. And, and even if you do have the best of intentions, which I hope I do have, I still found it really hard to think through that it needs to... And I think putting up guidelines like this and stating it really clearly... It didn't, doesn't sort of feel, although I take your point about rules and everything, but um, I don't know, there's something about like social licence, like if there's words out there like guidelines saying that it's, it's not okay to be cruel to animals, and especially I really agree um, with not bringing animals into the gallery because the gallery space, and a fine art gallery space in, specifically, is a really specific space. Um, which is actually hard for human beings, let alone <laughs> non-human beings. <laughs> um, so anyway, I wanted to thank you for the, for the guidelines. I thought they were great. Thank you. Thanks. Questions, comments? Peter again? Thank you. It's a really interesting. Um, Steve Baker's book about artists that has work on artists who go and work in the actual habitat. And I noticed that there is sort of a few more performances that have reversed the idea of where the performance should take place. In our field, we'd call it site-specific performance, but actually working in the habitat rather than in the human-centred space. So that, and bringing um, a documentation of that performance, or even a small audience, or if it's in a farmyard, it can be a, a reasonable audience. So there are other ways of thinking how this works or, right. or could pro potentially work. Okay, I, so that's from the yeah, I, not a complete ban position, <laughs> but a, a very carefully thought through um, way of working with animals in performance. We make that suggestion, actually. I thought that was one of our finer moments, was to actually make that suggestion in, of documentation. I mean, documentation is an important part of contemporary art and so it seems to me that that would we are awash with images and creating a whole new set of images i don't know that that's going to make much difference that's where i went oh yes let's just do it with images but hang on i i just looked at a whole lot of critics who reviewed a production who virtually didn't mention the the one i'm thinking of had a living had footage of a living quoll which is an australian um species that is going extinct and I could only find one review of talking about the fantastic imagery of the quoll. This is m on the stage, the whole stage documentary footage for about four minutes. So that's why I went, okay well, you can't put a quoll in performance, but um, okay, what's gone on here that this animal has been made invisible. So, so I then well, how could this have happened? Okay. I, I, look, it's an interesting point, Peter. I, I guess in bringing the actual animal into a space, I think we... No, I know, but I, I, it, it's, it, it, look, it's fraught. I can't tell you how many times in my own work as an artist people have completely misread what I've done. And they have totally assumed that, despite the fact that I've been using animals, not so much more recently, but in, in, in older works, despite the fact that it was all about animals, they assumed that the animals were standing in for something to do with humans. Right. Totally read the animals' metaphors, symbols, etc. You can't control entirely what an audience will do. And I think the other problem with bringing actual animals into um, a, a space of, you know, of performance or a gallery or whatever, 
is at what point do you actually say it's actually, it's not so different from that sense of like of feeling like somehow we should have the right to see these animals. So we should have the right to go to a zoo or to a, you know, a place where animals are held captive so that we, being, it could even be a farm sanctuary, we then have the opportunity to interact with those animals. It still privileges us. Mm. And I don't, I'm not even that convinced that an engagement with captive animals does more than a good documentary does. You know, it's it's a really difficult, difficult thing. I do I do agree that you know we we suffer. We we sit through conferences that are all about animals, and there's not a single animal unless you go out onto the park and see some people with their dogs there. Carry on. Um, I, I just wanted to um, ask, to what extent you. Uh, had a problem with the the um, notes towards a manifesto for the consideration or treatment of animals in exhibitions, because that's a very good set of you know guidelines or, or indicators of what might be sort of useful for artists in, in considering all these things. I think you know, um, including you know very specifically the use of live animals in exhibitions. I'm just wondering to what extent you thought that Mark's um, manifest or notes towards manifesto were somehow wanting. I, I actually um, have thought a lot about this, and in fact, um, at my art school, we are running a new unit in first year, which is all about manifesto. And I love the idea of kind of working this up as a kind of a manifesto. Um, and you know, I think that's something that maybe might respond to your point about how to deal with it in a more creative sense, to look at that long history of artist manifestos. Um, sorry. Oh, that particular one. Yeah. Mm, oh, Mark Dyne's piece, sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, it is a well thought out piece and I've read that a number of times and I think he makes really important points and I think, in a sense... It doesn't go far enough. No, it doesn't go far enough. It, for us. Yeah, not it doesn't go he far enough. He says, like, yeah. um, it's... If an animal dies during an exhibition, it's in the responsibility mm. of the artist. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's making it quite clear that this is a responsibility, um, and I think then, of course, that that refers the artist back to to a particular kind of um, uh, an understanding of that responsibility, you know, her or his own responsibility in relation to that mm -hmm. subject. Um, and I think, I don't know, I can't help feeling that's, that's a very important point, that artists do have that responsibility. And, and in your guidelines, um, I've noticed, and I've only just read them, but it, it sort of rather points to the fact that artists don't think about this stuff, you know? And that, and that it needs a set of people who are going to censor, or, and I know you've said that it's not censorship, mm -hmm. I know you said it's not going to be prescriptive, or it's not going to be, you know, um, you know um, in any way reductive in principle. It's just that they're, they're, they're couched in such terms that it looks very reductive, it looks very sort of constraining, it looks very, you know, s s censoring in a sense. And I think there's a problem in the tone of these guidelines. Sorry, I mean, that's my first impression. Yeah, maybe, maybe we should also call it like towards guidelines, like uh, Mark Dian's piece is not, it's an artwork actually, it's not a manifesto. It's not called manifesto for artists uh, working with the living world or something like that. It's um, notes towards um, a manifesto. Maybe we should uh, call our guidelines notes towards uh, guidelines or so. But I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I mean yeah. to make it more open, we, as it has been said several times, it's not prescripti prescriptive, but you read it as censorship or as and we don't want that, of course. So maybe we should ma make that clearer. But you said, I mean, one of the artists you just mentioned yeah, changed her mind. Yeah, um, it was like, wow. Also, but Kathy, I, Kathy High yeah. afterwards thought, okay, And it's not Julie okay. Andreev, who I know, oh, you yeah, know, used also. to work with her dogs in, on, in performance and now has decided herself not to do that. I guess as, as somebody who's been at this for a, a long time, I didn't really think anybody would listen <laughs> Nobody ever listens to what I want them to do. I've all got, I've gotten used to that. And that's why I thought, let's go as far as we can. I mean, I think that's my, my goal. But, you know, I don't have anything to lose. Um, you it's know. maybe also provocation to, to yeah, see. Yeah, it's a provocation. I mean, in some yeah. ways, it's, it's, pro it's provoking. It's <laughs> yes. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not allowed to do that. When I, uh, <laughs> when I first read the guidelines, I, um, and I respect where both of you are coming from with having a prescriptive list, but I read them more in terms of like a, for a curator who's thinking about an exhibition, how yes. would they put this yes. together, as opposed yeah. to an artist yeah. trying to like, you know, put, put the reins on them and hold them back. Um, and Just within that, I, I found this to be really exciting um, because it is a conversation because there, is so, there are so little guidelines for curators my experience in dealing with editors and curators is that they don't know anything about animals. They see animal art as like, as animal art, kind of like kids in photography. I mean, sorry, yeah, sh shooting kids basically is how it's seen. It's lowbrow. It's not considered, you know, a, an important subject matter. And so the idea that one might be cruel to this unimportant subject matter is <laughs> like another s step um, that's not even thought of. So I thought this was extremely helpful and a really great way to start the engagement and the conversation of this. And I'm wondering if other curators maybe have responded, not just artists, but curators, or even editors for that matter? I don't know, but um, I mean, this was the whole point. That we developed the guidelines for, for a specific situation for the mining animals um, exhibition here in Mexico City. And a little bit maybe out of, we didn't really trust the curator that was appointed to curate the show. and we, um, that was a person who didn't know about animals at all. He was not interested in animals. Um, so I think, at least, we don't know. Him, I don't know him personally, but we had the impression oh, that he true. needed, yeah, but he needed but some guidelines, maybe. The curator was trying to be yeah. more interested in one. Uh, Janet, you want to ask another question? Um, you know, I think it's great that you've done this, and it is like minding animals is a specific group of people with a specific sort of concern, and. It's in, in a way you're a front line and you're stating things that need to be stated. I mean, okay, maybe they should be stated in, there are other ways to state them, like as provocations or whatever, but these are really important provocations that in a way you in your specific situation or us in our specific situation have really thought about and it's really important in a way to put it out there and not be held back in your freedom of speech to say these are things we're really concerned about and we want other people to think about them and I think your point about for curators because I think curators need to articulate what they're on about you know they can't just have exhibitions about animals without actually thinking what does this mean not just is this good art whatever that means you know what's behind the idea of good art or good aesthetics like I think it's really important that these things be brought out. And if, okay, this is suggesting maybe a different sort of language that, you know, opens up the provocativeness of it, but it's a really important provocation, and I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. As Thank you. I think most people here do, that, that you've done this thinking. Um, Carol was just saying that um, between the three of us, we've all sort of written quite a lot around this subject and we had intended to try and actually put a slide up, but we didn't get that together. But there is further reading to be done and, and further reading on both sides Yeah, like of Steve this. Baker. I yeah. mean, I've read Steve Baker. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure you have. So. Yeah. But, you yeah, know, I mean, it's, it's great to get feedback. It, also for us, coming from both sides of this, from people who feel like it's valuable from people who feel like, you know, it's problematic. It's contentious, there's no doubt about it. Anything that ever touches on the idea, and I'm not someone who, who favours in general any kind of level of censorship, but by the same token, I think, you know, there are, um, as one of the um, audience members pointed out, you know, there are things around cultural sensitivities that we need to take into account. There are things to do with um, sensitivities to whether it be to do with gender. Um, gender, yeah, or race or whatever else. As artists, we have a responsibility to actually take these things into account. Um, and so our guidelines are simply there in an acknowledgement of how strong the visual and creative arts in general are within animal studies to say, well, Given the strength of this, and we see it at every conference, there are numerous sessions covering the creative arts within animal studies conferences. It would be great to see more exhibitions take place 
alongside animal studies conferences wherever possible. But when that happens, they have to be done in a way where these things are taken into account. And so that was the key purpose for these guidelines. I must say there's also very various points of view, even within this. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Oh. It's not like we didn't disagree with not each other. No. <laughs> oh my God, there's a long, long chain of like emails that went on behind these guidelines. Months, it would be good for others to see them. Yeah, sure. It would be great. And I, I, you know, I, I can't hear, I don't know your name. Um, I think Nori's point is superb in the sense of uh, uh, that provocation. You know, maybe, you should, maybe you should set up an art exhibition around this, where there is provocation and there, and there, there is discussion, mm -hmm. and you're including these stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so it becomes almost like your own marketing tool, it, and people feel free enough to engage it and to say, okay, it has some transformative power. It's, cha it's changed my perspective. No. Yeah. Um, I just want to say the, um, ma you know, ma oh, I just Sorry. wanted to quickly say Mark Last Dion. Yeah. So Mark Dion wrote that manifesto in I think 2000 or 2000, oh, 2000, year 2000. 2000. So that was like 17 years ago, yeah, yeah. and I only read it recently, and I felt quite uncomfortable with it actually because. What, one of the things he makes clear is that he thinks, he assumes artists will be working with animals as a material, and um, as a material, it's our responsibility with what we do with that animal. Well, I actually found that um, problematic. Yeah. And um, I wonder if he would still think that today, 17 years later, because there's been an explosion of artists working with animals, live animals, in the gallery. And that's why we need now to sort of think about what sort of social license do we are we going to give artists to do that sort of thing under the um the rule that artists can do anything they want very quick comment i think it's a really important closing point you know we've come a long way since then and and as a field things are developing really rapidly um and you know i think you're right there has been an explosion of the of the of the use of animals in various ways within the creative arts, and it's something that needs to be taken into account. So. Uh, before we um, finish, just I made the comment earlier, and this is very limited the number of people here. Uh, I mentioned that there, uh, regarding the fire or earthquake exits, there actually was two earthquakes this morning. But <laughs> some of you might have felt so. Did just be feel aware. That? I don't feel. <laughs> never feel Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much, you everybody. Oh, no, 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 no. oh my goodness! Did you feel it, Rob? Mm -hmm.